So can I do my three, two, one, or yeah, of course I can. Uh, yeah. Then you have one of those. Host. In three, two, one. Welcome back to Decouple. I talk a lot about living in Ontario and um, living next to or nearby the world's largest operating nuclear plant. I seem to say that with pride a lot on the podcast, but today we're here. Um, we are at Bruce Power. Um, it's not on Bruce Peninsula, but we're on the beautiful Great Lakes. Um, and I also uh, talk a lot of, oh fuck, I think I'm fucking this up. Let me just do this again, sorry. It was lovely. Was it? Okay. I mean, it was flowing. Welcome back to Decouple. Today we're coming to you direct from Bruce Power. And it's a place I talk about a lot. Um, and a place I'm kind of proud of as an Ontarian and, uh, and a nuke bro, I guess. Um, it is the world's largest operating nuclear facility. Um, and it plans to stay that way uh, for quite a long time. And the reason why is because they're involved in refurbishing uh, all of their reactors. And it's uh, a concept that I'm trying to get my head around and understand better. So uh, I decided to come up here and talk with someone who knows what he's talking about. So um, Jeff Phelps, welcome to the show. If you can do uh, on the podcast, we do sort of self-introduction. Yep, I find fine. that more interesting. Yep, so just sure. go ahead, introduce yourself, your background, what you do, hobbies, okay. anything interesting, but keep it to like, 40 seconds. 40 seconds, okay. <laughs> Jeff Phelps, VP of uh, Major Projects at Bruce Power. Uh, very lucky and proud and privileged to actually lead the refurbishment of the six remaining units to be refurbished at Bruce Power. We've done two already. Um, so we're, we've actually on our third refurbishment on the site. Um, and we have a 12 year program to refurbish the remaining six units. And we're two and a half years into the first unit, which is unit six. Awesome, awesome. But just a couple things about yourself too, though. Okay, yeah, I'm handsome, good-looking, tall, dark. You know, my, my brother's Michael Phelps, really nice. Right. Right? <laughs> um, originally, originally born in Scotland. Um, I've worked around the UK, France, the States, and now I've been working in Canada since 2003. So I've been lucky enough to be engaged with all of the refurbishments uh, right the way across the Bruce site. Um, I'm an engineer by trade, so I'm, I'm, I've got a degree in engineering. Um, but I'm also a trades guy, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. I'm in the UK. I went through a mechanical apprenticeship. Then I did an electrical traineeship. And then I went and did a design degree. Wow. So I have a, a very background in understanding construction um, and many aspects of mechanical and electrical work. So it gives me a good founding for something as large as a refurbishment project. You're one of the rare engineers that's not wearing the ring. Oh, uh, yeah. So in the UK, yeah. I'm not allowed to wear a, a ring in Ontario unless I go and sit an ethics exam. Ah. So don't take this wrong way, but I said, no, not happening, dude. <laughs> Jesus, if you think I've got to sit an ethics exam to wear a ring on my finger, not happening. All right. right. All right, cool. Let's get down to the, the meat of this interview. Um, I've been trying to get my head around what exactly refurbishment is. Um, and I've been thinking through a few, I guess, kind of uh, metaphors or analogies. Uh, but I think a lot of people, they hear, you know, that the the design life of a can-do is 30 or 40 years. Um, so what's, what's going on? How can a station go 80 years or how far can it go? So how do you, how do you explain, how do you break it down, simplify it? What analogies do you use to, to explain what's going on here with the refurbs? Yeah, I, I think the analogy really I'd use is always when you look at a car. Yeah. Um, there's cars on the road today that have been, you know, been safely driven for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and the way that they've, they've managed that is they refurbish elements of those cars to get them safer. Mm -hmm. So they replace the engine, the reactor, they right. replace that. They re change the brakes, they'll change the tires. So you have regular maintenance that we have at a nuclear power station, it's called asset management. Um, and then you go in once through the lifetime of the moment and replace the critical components, and we call them the large components, major component replacement. Such things as the steam generators, the reactor, and they are primarily the big pieces of the heart of the, the, of the unit that you need to change to extend the life beyond the, 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 the approved 30 years, 40 years of operation. Right. And like, do you come out with, in, ter in terms again of kind of the reactor internals with something like in a condition that is as new? I've heard people say it's even better than new because you've learned a bunch of stuff from operations. You might have improved some of the alloys or I'm not sure what, what yeah, would we, be. We certainly do that. So a lot of the materials that we put in are based on what we've observed through the operating life cycle of the first 30 years of the unit. Um, so we do, we do tweak the design a little bit. But the major components that we do, they're very minor tweaks to it. Yeah. Um, so it's very similar to a like for like replacement. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the original strategies where we got a, a financial approvals to proceed was limited first of a kind. Right. Uh, because we have a proven technology, it's proven it's been safe to operate for 30 years. 
So if you look at it, no difference to a car. You, you know you can drive a car for a certain period of time, and you know you need to do regular maintenance, asset management to that car, right. do the oil changes, change the tires, wiper blades, etc. But every now and again, if you really want to extend the life of the vehicle, you've got to change the brakes. You might have to change the wheels. You've got to change the engine. Right. That's the way the analogy I would put it for most people to understand is very similar to that. Yeah, I guess the car thing, for me, it's like, yeah, but I mean, who wants to, I mean, there are some people that want to drive a classic car, you know, maybe it's a muscle car from the 60s or something. And obviously, I mean, it's just that nuclear reactors are very different than like a, a consumer electronic device or vehicle. I think people kind of expect the same sort of like, well, you know, why are we still driving those old cars? So that's that's why it doesn't necessarily completely, I, there's no perfect analogy. I, guess, there, right? I wouldn't say there's a perfect analogy, but there's an element to it as well where there's, there's the element of cost comes into that. Yeah. So the business case to actually refurbish a unit is significantly different to build in a new unit. Right. Um, and you would have heard that as there are new units being built around the world. Right. You know, there's, I, I worked on a unit in the UK for a couple of years as well. There's a lot of properties and, and development in China. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge is they have different different models, right? We have a unit here, we have a great facility. Right. The infrastructure is there, which again is a huge cost adder. So if you've actually got the infrastructure here, the distribution system, right. and all you're gonna do then is extend the life of the unit, the, 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 it's a much more cost uh, enabler to do that than right. it is cost prohibitive to knock these units down and build a brand new unit. Yeah, I mean, and, and I've been looking at this again as an outsider, non-engineer, um, and it's there's some things that seem basic but that are pretty complicated, like pouring nuclear concrete, getting the rebar just right. I know in the AP 1000 site in Vogel, they kind of messed that up and then had to jackhammer out yep. nuclear concrete and rebar as thick as my wrist and things like that. So I, I guess that brings us to the next question, which is, um, you know, how many times can you refurbish? What, what's the things that limit, ultimately limit the life of a plant? Like, you know, this plant is going to go to, I think, the 2060s. 20, like 2064 80. is kind of end, end of the site life, current site life. Current site life. Yeah, current site life. Could you refurb again? It, it would really depend on another life cycle. So we've never taken a unit through, you know, two life cycles. Right. So what we consistently do is inspect. And right. that's what our outage program does. We go in and we expect the components to ensure that they're behaving the way we had uh, thought and designed so we, we measure that, and if we have to tweak as we go, I, I think the, the challenge for the, um, you know, the beyond 60 or 70 years of life after the refurbishment, so total, total lifespan, I think the challenge will be you know, looking at technology which is 60 or 70 years old, mm -hmm. and I think the new technology will, will be very different in you know, another 30 years of operating life. Uh, so I think the plan itself could get there um, as long as you maintain it well. That's the most important thing is you, after the refurbishment is to keep the maintenance up. Right. And again, no difference to a vehicle. If you don't maintain it, yeah. it, it, it won't run for the you know, projected period of time. Right. For sure. So a big part of you know my interest as someone who views nuclear as being like the keystone technology of our energy transition, the thermodynamically viable replacement um, for fossil fuels. I guess in not every capacity, but in many, um, is we need to we need to get a lot of nuclear. We got we need to refurbish what we have. We need to build new nuclear, um, and I'm always trying to learn. And I call it the secret sauce. But you know, around the world, there's been these magical decades in multiple countries, almost like a baton being passed, of getting it right, knowing how to do it well, getting it done on budget and on time. Um, and so, you know, again, as a humble outsider, some of the, the patterns that I see, particularly in the West, uh, with new build nuclear, is we focused on, you know, fancy new designs, first of a kinds, um, with atrophied workforces and atrophied supply chains um, that are not familiar with the new technology, never done it before. And so, uh, you know, my thesis in Canada is that in the West, we're sort of uniquely advantaged, you know, once we do these refurbs, to build new can do, you know, with a, with a turnkey technology we already we have, fully licensed, um, with, a, again, a workforce and supply chain that's ramped up. So. We've, we've talked a little bit about like how different refurb is from new build. And I'm really asking a pretty loaded question here. Sort of, but does that seem sensible to you? And, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit about you know, how, many, how many people are working on site and just yep. how ramped up what that supply chain looks like. But so we're, we're, what do you think of that thesis? Yeah, we're, we're extremely lucky in Candu. Mm -hmm. Extremely lucky. So when you go back to the original design of the plants, 90% of our, our, our equipment to, that we need for refurbishment is actually in Ontario. Yeah. Right. So steam generators manufactured just down the road at BWXT in Cambridge. Yeah. A lot of our individual components all around the GTA and St. Catharines area. Right. So you know fuel channels made by GE. They're they're all local in Ontario. So one of the challenges with new build again is the supply chain is worldwide. Mm -hmm. And and as COVID has really taught us through we're operating a, a mega project through a pandemic. If you have a supply chain that's local. 
um, it is a lot easier to get your plant equipment timely because some of the, 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 the bigger projects, I look at some of the bigger projects around the world, they've been significantly impacted by supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been extremely lucky that way. And, and as a refurbishment, and same with new build, the strategy is you procure early, you actually have the equipment on site ready to go. Mm -hmm. And that's what we did here on, on unit six. And we've done the same for future units, the next unit being unit three. We're starting to get equipment on site six months ahead of when you actually physically need it. Right. Um, and with the supply chain, some of the materials, what, what people don't realize is where, you have, where you've had a lull in, in manufacture, such as design and build of a nuclear power station, the supply chain hasn't kept up. Yeah. They've diversified their own supply chains to go off and build and manufacture other things. Right. So getting that supply chain back engaged where we worked really very well with OPG to build the supply chain back up in Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've done that locally, we've done it with, with local resources um, as much as we can. So that's the, the difference when people keep saying, you know, why don't you do new build and you'll get another projected 40 years. You can get 40 years out of this unit. You have to operate, maintain it really well. You have a d diverse supply chain local to supply materials for the next 30 or 40 years right. as well, right. right? So you're not impacted by any of those pro projected impacts from supply chain, which is impacting every project mm -hmm. across the planet at the moment. So I, I think, um, you know, there's a tendency to, to maybe fetishize is the wrong word, right? But it's, it's kind of new designs. Maybe this is a field that's dominated by engineers. You have yeah. problems you want to solve. Everyone's kind of just chomping at the bit to you know, do some new blueprints. Um, but something that I've been drawn towards is, again, the importance of the, the human factors um, and those human resources, right? So um, I guess from project managers like yourself yep. um, down to you know, the skilled trades involved um, in, in building this, um, that seems like a huge resource. And I want to talk about a little bit of, of the, the challenges, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I've heard is that um, one of the challenges is just finding people that, that have those skills and, sure. and the numbers we need. Like how many, how many people are involved in this refurb? How many people are coming in and off site every day to, so, get, a, to get a sense of that? So on the site itself, um, we have over 7,000 people come into site every day. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine during the pandemic, we significantly reduced that number on site. So we only maintained a, what we call a core competency to, to run the, the, the site safely. Um, and then we had our construction workers. And at that point in time, we had roughly around 600 people on site every day. Mm -hmm. And well, I should say every shift because we actually operate the project 24 hours a day, seven mm -hmm. days a week. Okay. Um, so, you know, we had 12 people employed, 1,200 people employed, 600 on days, 600 on nights to right. keep the work maintaining is because obviously the generation cost is significant so you want to do the project as safely as you can in the shortest period right. so we see and um, we've worked really closely with the Ontario building trades to ensure that they understand the resources that we're projecting to use across the decade of, of MCR and across the refurbishment window for Darlington as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, we meet with the building trades every month to go through that, understand what our projections look like, understand what their feed looks like. So we've encouraged them to build their apprenticeship programs to feed this over the period of time that we're refurbishing. Um, the, the influence that we don't have is what goes on around us. Right. Um, and obviously with the pandemic and projects closing down, we had, a, we had the, the resources available. Right. Obviously a, a risk as you identify is the trades now as other projects pick up around the country mm -hmm. um, and specifically if you look down south where they're saying some of the infrastructure projects could kick off um, we, we could be skill we could be challenged for some of those skilled resources in years to come mm -hmm. um, the, the one thing that we do have the, the lock off here is, is it's more of a, a mechanical type work so it's not civil a lot of the civil work that, and the infrastructure is around concrete we don't do concrete in this refurbishment it's a lot of mechanical electrical right. work right. so okay. it tends to be different skill sets and different trades but it, it, it means that we have to work very closely with the building trades which you know we can't do these we can't do these refurbishments without the building trades they're such a right. key component uh, that we are in lockstep with them every month we meet with them to discuss it yeah no, i mean i think that 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 point about the the Supply chain issues. We've seen that with COVID being a major factor, and there's a big benefit, obviously, to to building stuff in our country, in our province. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've heard about the economic multiplier effect with these refurbishments. You spend a dollar, you get a buck forty out. Absolutely. Um, you got skilled labor making good wages and spending it in their communities, and we, you know, we live in this era of the so-called fire economy, right? Like finance, insurance, um, renewable energy. No, what is it again? R E. Real estate. Right, uh, where there's not a productive economy, we're not manufacturing things here in our backyard, um, and so I'm trying to get a sense, you know, within the broader uh, Ontario economy, um, how big of a deal are these refurbishments to maintaining manufacturing, um, to 
building stuff here. Yeah, so, so really for us, the, the, the two key areas which we manufacture locally are all around those key components. So the steam generators, as an example. You've got a 168 ton cartridge, there's eight of them per unit for, Bruce, for, uh, for each one of the units. Um, so to keep uh, people engaged in Cambridge manufacturing those, we're gonna give them at least seven to eight to nine years work. And so BWXT are actually manufacturing steam generators today for unit five when we go back in 2027. Yeah. So, you know, all that, all that employment is going to be uh, between now and the end of the decade is going to be focused in Ontario, which to me gives us that bridge to, you know, the other things that are going to happen um, around you know, other projects kicking off, other technologies kicking in. Um, there's certainly a diversification from some of those vendors as well into other industries. So they, they get a, a core competency in what they do for us, and then they can actually apply that core competency to other industries as well, and bring that OPEX and lessons learned to us as well. Because right. there are other technologies out there that do things better than we do. Yeah. And we're trying to learn that so we can ensure we can do it safer, and again, shorter and cheaper. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal across the next 12 years. We have to continue to execute safe, that's our primary focus, always, always we'll, we'll talk safety, it's, it's our primary focus all the time every day. Um, and the reality then is making sure that we can keep as much local as we can. Um, and I would tell you that one thing we've learned in, through COVID is although people can work remotely, We've really found, and, and you'll hear this from other companies as well, the dynamics, you need the dynamics of the team. We can't build remotely. We have to build on site, right, right. right? So we need the trades local to Ontario. We can't get them from anywhere else. Yeah. So we know that there, there's always going to be a requirement for them locally. That thrives in the community because, you know, buck 40 for every buck that we pay, which, which is just awesome turnover for the next 10 to 12 years of the community, which, again, in, the, the, in Ontario, it's critical. I think it's a critical yeah. resource that we need. You know, I visited the Bruce plant, I think it was Bruce A, last year. And, um, you know, looking at the building, looking at the complexity there, you know, it felt like my generation can't do this anymore. When I, you know, we talk about the challenges of just building a bridge or getting anything done. Um, you know, and it's almost like there was a great generation that came before. Um, I just, we're just going to wrap up any minute now, but I wanted to get a sense of, you know, I guess maybe I love getting an on the ground feeling for what happened. And we're going to splice in a little bit of B-roll here, but I think probably the crane story would be it. But just just to give us a, a quick little vignette of something big yeah. <laughs> that's happened on site. So, so when you when you get the, when you get the pictures, you'll see that the, the crane that we use, is, is, it doesn't matter what it's called, it's PTC um, 35, but um, it's an 1800 ton crane. Um, to lift a steam generator, which is you know, shaped something very similar to, to this. Um, and the, the steam generator itself, about 168 tons. Um, and it's not necessarily for, for, the, for the crane companies and the people that work this, that's quite a small lift. Huh. But for a nuclear generating station where we lift 168 tons and we traverse it out of the reactor building and into a safe cradle, Right, that's a significant evolution. And to see it happen, I've, I've been very lucky to have done it on units one and two and unit six now. Um, to see the guys doing the work and the girls doing the work, it, it's the meticulous level of detail that they do in the planning right. and then the execution of the work. I mean, it's actually one of the most tedious things to watch because the, the speed that we lift the steam generator out of the reactor building is literally you can't see it move. Right. So to actually stand there for an hour and watch a steam generator being lifted out is, is uneventful. Right. And we need it uneventful because we don't want, uh, obviously, anything to happen. But the, the crane, it arrives in a, about 130 C containers. It takes three months to build. Right? It takes six weeks to, to demolish and, and remove again from site. Yeah. It's a huge piece of equipment, but it's, uh, it's so impressive when you see it. Um, everybody want, uh, wants to see the, the, the crane, and, and one of the best pictures you'll ever see is, is a steam generator um, being hung off the crane as it's lifted out of a building. Right. Um, it's an amazing sight to see. And you know then that the replacement part was actually manufactured just down the road here, two hours, two hours away in Cambridge. Right. So right. you're changing those components out with locally Ontario-made equipment. It's, yeah. it's, it's an awesome job. Jeff, I could talk to you all day, yeah. um, but we do have an exciting day ahead of us. We're, we're touring the plant. Um, yeah, not as exciting as this, trust me. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly right. right. Um, so we're going to have to mosey on, um, but maybe we'll get you back uh, to, to fill us in on some more details. Not a problem. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with nice you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for coming Thanks. on Decouple. You're absolutely welcome. Thanks.